seek a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my God. Hold me closely to His side with love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for, for finding some time to join with us this morning. A story is told of a man who was asked by the pastor to pray in a prayer meeting. And it was his first time to experience such a request. And everyone was kneeling and everyone was waiting for the brother to pray. But then this brother tiptoed and went to the pastor. Everyone is closing their eyes and he whispered to the pastor and said, Pastor, I do not know how to pray. And the pastor whispered back to him, Tell the Lord that you do not know how to pray. And the gentleman went back to his seat and he tried to tell the Lord that he did not know how to pray. But that was not working, so he went back to the pastor. Remember, everyone is waiting. And he said, Pastor, I don't know what to say. I do not even know how to tell the Lord that I do not know how to pray. And the pastor encouraged him again. Just tell the Lord that you do not know how to pray. The rest of the company did not hear what passed between them. But then the man, following the pastor's advice, he began to confess he is not knowing how to pray as he was to pray. And he pleaded with the Lord to teach him how to pray. And he then proceeded in prayer to the satisfaction of all in the company. So often than not, we have hard believers, whenever they are asked to pray, their prayer is almost predictable. It behaves as though they have reacted their prayer. You ask someone to pray, they are open in prayer, come rain, come sunshine, it is just the same. The mid part of their prayer is the same, and the conclusion is the same. And the things they pray for every other time, they are basically the same. But then, prayer is basically communication between us and God. The pouring out of our hearts to the Lord and should not be really asked, but should come from a heart full of obedience and submission. Praise the Lord. It seems that during the New Testament days, Religious leaders used to teach their followers how to pray. That is why the disciples of Jesus asked him to teach them how to pray. And that is where Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer. Today, I want us to pay close attention to a few uh, words in our Lord's Prayer that we always confess every day. And one of them is the understanding of who's we belong and the forever and ever and the word Father in our prayer. As we pray, do we understand the words of our Lord's prayer? The first line of this prayer is the address. It symbols out the person to whom we are praying. And the person is our Father. What does Jesus want the disciples and us to learn from our Lord's prayer? The first thing that we learn is our identity. So often that not people like to identify with others. You know? And when you introduce yourself and say, for example, your name, there is a subsequent question that people will ask you. So my name is John Calavoto. 
And the subsequent question that someone would want to ask, and what do you do? And that is followed with them trying to bless you and find your identity. And so the first thing that we see here is identity. We know that as human beings, God owns us because He is a giver and a sustainer of life. He is our creator. But that is not the sense in which we refer to Him as our Father. One must be owned by God redemptively, having confessed Jesus as God and Savior in order to refer to God as our Father. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. John 1, 12 states that yet to all who believe in Him, to those who believe in His name, He gave them the right to become the children of God. You see, the phrase to become denotes the freedom to act and the authority for that action. You cannot call God Father if you do not have the proper credentials of sonship. The New Testament makes it clear as to who the children of God are. We read in Romans chapter 8 verse 14 that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit that makes you a slave to sin or fear, but you received the Spirit of sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. When you examine Genesis chapter 32, when Jacob is wrestling with the angel for the night, the angel of the Lord asks Jacob a very interesting question. What is your name? Does it mean that this all-knowing God does not know this is Jacob? But then when you examine that very well, a couple of years later, maybe 32 years back, Jacob had lied to his blind father that he was Esau. And he took the blessings of his brother. And he left. But now, he's wrestling with an angel. And an all-knowing God asks him, you, what is your name? And Jacob quickly nods that and he says, my name is Jacob. And the angel says, from today you are no longer Jacob, but your name is Israel. Friends, it is a stark reminder and a clear revelation that our Heavenly Father knows us by name. And He affirms for us our individuality, which is indivisible. We saw a joke the other day, and someone says, you know, ladies, when you come to church, make sure that you not, do not apply too much makeup, because when you pray, the Lord needs to know who. He's talking to you. <laughs> but see, whether or not with that, he affirms our identity, which is indivisible. He knows you by name. What else has he said? We read the story of Beatrice. Beatrice got a scholarship in the 90s to go and study medicine in Russia. And you know, back in the day, we did have good communication. People used to write letters. And so Beatrice is away for seven years. And when she comes back, she finds that the father got sick and he went into a coma. And so she stayed with her father for some time and then she went back to Russia. Russia had given her a job. And so she was away again for a couple of years and then she came back, you know, cumulatively after 11 years. And when she came back, when she did her opening word, without even calling the father, you know, introducing herself, the father noticed her voice. After 11 years of not speaking, and you see, 11 years is a very long time, you know, a lot of things change. But the moment she spoke, the father recognized her. And for that, she was grateful. Friends, our Heavenly Father cannot mistake us for any other. He knows us very well. You see, it is biblically wrong for people to think that there is a universal fatherhood and brotherhood in any sense whatsoever. According to this notion, God is the Father 
of the entire human race and we are all brothers and sisters as members of the universal family. You have heard people say that God is the creator of all of us and he cannot destroy us because he is the one who created us. Friends, nothing can be further from the truth. Notice what happens in John chapter 8. The Pharisees were claiming to be the children of Abraham and therefore, you know, by that connection, they were the children of God by ancestral association. But then Jesus tells them that if Abraham is your father, then you will be doing what Abraham would have done. Listen to what they say in John 8. Abraham is our father, they answer. If your father, uh, if you are Abraham's children, say Jesus, then you will do the things that Abraham did. As it is now, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such a thing. You are doing the things your own father does. Then they protested, we are not illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself. But then Jesus said to them, If God was your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but he, he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are able to hear what I say. You belong to your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. This encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees clearly indicates that there is a distinction between the children of God and the children of the devil. There are only two families, and everyone must belong to one or the other. You are not, you are either a member of the family of God with God as your father, or you are a member of the family of the devil with the devil as your father. But one common thing in both families is that members of each family do the will of their respective fathers. Do you belong to the family of God? Have you joined the family of God by surrendering, surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You cannot serve two masters. It is either you belong to God or you belong to the other camp. You cannot say that I am an independent candidate. Whether we like it or not, you either belong to God and you are a Christian or you belong to the other camp and you not being a Christian. 1 John 3 says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor anyone who does not love his brother. It is by God's love and grace that we are able to cross over and we become the children of God. Friends, when Jesus said that in John 14, that I am the way, the life, you know, and the truth, he did not say except him, and added a few other things. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, period. He who has a son has life. He who has not the son of God has not the life. First John 3 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. You see, friends, when you get the Son, you get all the components of meaning in life. Those of us who are in Christ have God as our Father. This is our identity. With this identity come privilege and responsibilities. And I would like to draw our attention to one of each. And one of the privileges we have as God's children is of God's fatherly discipline as he, by the Spirit of God, works to produce a harvest of righteousness and peace. God's discipline sometimes comes to us in form of suffering. Hebrews chapter 12 says, And who are hardship as discipline, 
God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You are not a true son and daughter at all. Moreover, our, help, our, earthly, our earthly fathers discipline us for evil, but our heavenly father disciplines us every other time. Therefore, strengthen yourself, even when this discipline comes. So one is discipline. That is a benefit and a privilege and a responsibility. But then on the other hand, and that is the Lord's responsibility, on the other hand, is our responsibility as a children of God. And this is to advance the cause of the gospel. This call is to obey the word of God and to magnify his name in all our undertakings. The second thing, remember the first thing is identity. The second thing is intimacy. The word Father was not the basic form of address for God found in the Old Testament. In fact, when the Hebrew is singing or praying or reading the Torah and they get to a point where it is written Yahweh or Father, they used to keep quiet because Yahweh which is the covenant, covenant name for Israel's God was regarded to be so sacred to even be pronounced. This made God to look like a distance to God from the common affairs of men. And so the old, community, the old covenant community never used the term Father to address God in prayer. So what we see in the New Testament is a radical departure from what transpires in the Old Testament. And Jesus brings us into an intimate relationship with the Father. And He grants us the incomparable privilege of calling God our Father. Praise the Lord. Amen. It is a privilege to call God our Father. Jesus makes prayer a personal and intimate discourse with God. God is within our reach and He desires a cross walk with us. We read in Romans chapter 8. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit that makes you a slave, but then you received a Spirit of sonship. And by that, you cry, Abba, Abba, Father, our Father. And Spirit Himself testifies that we are the children of God. We have confidence as we approach God in prayer, because the object of prayer is not a scary in personal force and known to us, but a loving and personal Father. We can come to Him courageously, even as we believe that He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We can boldly pour out our hearts before Him, just like Han, because He says, Ask and shall be given unto you. Seek and you will find. We can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence that Christ has revealed the Father to us. The psalmist says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The songwriter says, this is the confidence that we have. God will make a way where they seem not to be a way. Because He is a loving and a personal Father. Friends, He is a God who makes ways. May the Lord make a way for you in the situation you are trusting Him for. And apart from identity and intimacy, we also see involvement in this, you know, what we are looking at today. God is personally interested in our affairs. He is involved in our daily agendas to express and reassure us of His goodness. A child of God, remember that there is no time when your heavenly Father will leave you or forsake you. Isaiah 49 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Your heavenly Father, our heavenly Father, knows what we need. And he's always involved. James Russell Law says, Truth forever on the skeleton, wrong forever on the throne, yet the skeleton sways the future. But then behind the dim unknown stands God within the shadow, keeping watch, keeping watch above his own. There is a God, even when we don't see, even when we don't feel like it, there is a God who is keeping watch. Our Heavenly Father watches above his own. His angels around us, even when it feels that God is distanced, he is always involved. Remember what David proclaims, that I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging for bread. Think about the chorus that we have just sung, that I have a father who will never ever fail me. The hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus, part of that reads, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father will neither leave nor forsake us. He is always faithful, always caring, always concerned, and always listening. Even during those moments when it clearly feels like we are struggling alone, He is there with us. The quality, friends, of our prayer is dependent on what we know about God and the depth of our walk with Him. Our Father richly speaks of identity, intimacy, and involvement. But something to note, when we are in prayer and pouring out our hearts to the Lord, so often or not, we wonder, you trust in the Lord for something, you going through the prayer that we've been taught of supplication and adoration and all those things. But then for a second, you wonder, at that particular moment, then your prayer ends, and you are no longer addressing God, but then you are addressing yourself in prayer. Because as a child of God, when you pray, your prayer should be always directed to the Lord. When I ask you. Every other time when you pray, your prayer should always be directed to the Lord. As these children, we have been adopted into his family. And he has lavished amazing love to us. We should submit to him because the phrase our Father also instructs us. We have to be interested in praying for others, those members who belong to the family of God. Remember, in our Lord's Prayer, we do not pray, My Father in heaven. We pray, Our Father who art in heaven. What does that mean? That means that all of us as sons and daughters have one Father. There is one universal church. There is one universal family, and that is the family of the redeemed. Those who've given their lives to the Lord, they have the right to address God as their Father. When I pray, I don't merely address God as my Father, but our Father. This means that we must express our love for our brethren by praying for them. We are not to be so we are to be concerned about their affairs just as we are about our affairs. So next time when you are praying, I know there's a bit whereby you have to pray for your own personal needs. But even when you're praying for your own personal needs, remember that that same God is the father of your brother and sister. So when you pray, that is the reason Jesus you know, encourages them, pray like this, our father who art in heaven. Not my father who is at heaven. Our identity, intimacy, 
involvement where we belong to God redemptively. Jesus has redeemed us and therefore we are at peace with God. He forgives us. You know, forgiveness is also part of that. And this Father has given us, you know, the incomparable privilege of being the children of God. And by that, when we call Him our Father, when He looks at us, He looks at us through the eyes of grace and sonship and forgiveness. And then we have intimacy whereby Jesus has brought us into an intimate relationship with the Father. Lastly, we have involvement, where God is involved in our daily agendas to express and reassure us of His goodness. Humanly speaking, you know, there are moments when it does not feel like God is really involved in our challenges, in our issues, in our sufferings. But friends, God is fully involved. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Friend Jesus knows our every weakness. But then we are encouraged to take it to the Lord in prayer. Praise the Lord. You remember King George the Sixth? This is the father of King of Queen Elizabeth who died the other day. During the uh, Second World War in 1939, he said this, a new year is at hand. We cannot tell what it will bring. If it brings us peace, how thankful we shall be to the Lord. If it brings us continued struggle, we shall remain courageous. But then he goes forth and he makes a very powerful statement that I am interested in. He says that I say to the man who stood at the gate of the year, Give me light that I may face and trade safely into the dark of my hand. And he replied and said, Go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of the Lord, and it shall be to you better than light and safer than the dawn. My dear Christian brother, go out even when you are struggling and put your hand in the hand of the Lord and shall be safer and better because God is actively involved in everything that we are doing. And having God as our Father, as we walk, let us walk with the lightness and the sobriety and the seriousness at the same time of our steps. And we will clearly understand what the Bible says and why it says what it does. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, those who proclaim salvation. If you belong to the camp where God is your Father, may the name of the Lord be praised. And may you diligently serve Him and live for Him. But then if you belong to the other camp where the devil is your Father, you are welcome to join the family of those who are redeemed. It is my prayer that as your priest, I wish you every good blessing that comes from the Father. Father, you know, close every door that brings calamity and pain and sorrow in your family. Yes. And it's my prayer that the Lord will open doors of prosperity yes. and doors of peace and doors of grace in all that you do. Yes. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. Yes. And may His grace always be sufficient here in yes. Amen. And I want you to know, even when we pray, that we are praying to a God who is always listening, who is always involved. Even in those moments when prayers don't make sense, even in those moments that you behave like Andrew Fuller, you do not know what to tell the Lord. He is always involved. And I want us to finish this summer by reciting the words of our Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven.
to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way.